regression analyze, sorry, analyze and disseminate data across various sectors. Uh, the impact extend to different areas, influence decision making, policy formulation, and public awareness. So here you have uh, some good colleagues uh, that you share, sorry about the, the noise, uh, the expertise experience today. Let me uh, tell you about your panelists today. So to begin our presentation, you have Gia. Gia is a co-founder of the program and director of uh, Icebreak One. She leads a strategic program that focuses on create cultural change and how you share data across different data uh, sectors, but also have experience in background in disaster, urban resilience, and language with different public interests. And so, Gia, uh, very welcome to have uh, you here. Feel free to uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. And um, hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Um, I do have some slides if you wouldn't ask. Oh, thank you so much for sharing those for me. And um, so I guess I just also want to say thank you to Wilfreda for inviting me and for organising this and um, to all my fellow panellists for making time for this exciting panel. I'm really excited to hear um, all of your presentations. So my name is Gaya Mikic. Um, I am the co-founder and the program director at Icebreaker One. And so what I'm going to try and do today is share some of my lessons learned and experiences of building collaboration across industries and sectors in the UK to enable data sharing at scale. Um, so I have to do the kind of standard bit first, What a little bit about Icebreaker One. Um, so Icebreaker One is an independent, non-partisan non-profit, um, and we have a mission to make data work harder to deliver net zero. The thing that we do is uh, work at the intersection of climate finance, of data and industry. Um, before I talk about any data, it's really important to note that we as an organisation actually never store or touch any of the data. Um, what we do is we bring people together to agree what they want to do, and then we help them implement that through something we call a trust framework. And trust frameworks are a way that computers, organisations and people can trust each other to share data using commonly agreed rules. Um, if we could please skip to the next slide. Um, so the perspective that I bring is from a whole systems view of designing and delivering projects across water, across energy and across finance. And I'll talk about those in more detail later today. Um, but I think it's good to start from the basics. So the fact that we're here means that we all know and we acknowledge that data is key to good decision making for us to be able to reach net zero. Um, and we also know that there's huge volumes of relevant data that are created every day by individuals, by businesses and governments. But right now, it's really hard to find and to access that data that we need. Um, and there are the reason for this is basically that there are powerful cultural, technical, legal and commercial barriers that stop this from being shared, which means it's, um, the data is massively underutilized. So what we're doing at Icebreaker One is trying to break down these barriers. Um, our goal is to make it easy to find, access, and trust the data that we reach um, that we need in order to reach net zero. Um, and one of the ways that we can see how we're doing that is if um, any of you are kind of multitasking or want to look at something else at the same time, you can go to OpenNetZero.org and you can see all of the data that we've indexed so far. We've tried to make it really easy to search for and. Um, find and access the data that relates to the core use cases and the programs that we're working on at the moment. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. I think one of the key things that um, I always talk about, and anyone who's heard me talk about anything to do with Icebreaker One before will have heard me bang on about this a lot, but um, collaboration is really at the heart of what we do. Um, so what we do is we bring people together. We bring people together from different organizations to develop data use cases, to identify the barriers to data flow, and then to co-define the commercial, legal, and technical rules for data sharing. And we call this process icebreaking. Um, an example of this in action is one of our flagship programs called Open Energy. Um, we started this in 2020 under the UK government's Modernizing Energy Data Access Program. Um, and that was um, produced as a result of a recommendation from the Energy Data Task Force, which also catalyzed the development of the Energy Data Best Practices, which have now um, become a license condition and kind of are a way in which um, energy companies in the UK, so the, um, so the six big um, distribution network operators and anyone who has um, and who has who is kind of licensed under um, the energy regulations has to um, publish open data. 
But what we did under Open Energy um, in 2020 was that we brought together over 300 people to change the way that energy data is shared in the UK. So I mentioned Open Net Zero previously, but also if you go to openenergy.org.uk, you will now be able to search for more than 30,000 data sets within seconds, all of which relate to some of the core use cases we've developed. Um, now, the reason why I'm also talking about open energy a lot is because it's one of the first um, projects that we ran as a small organization. So when we had just started out, um, we were working on applying the rules of open banking to solve for digitalization in the energy sector. And when we started doing this in 2020, one of the biggest struggles was actually trying to get people to understand the difference between open and shared data and therefore what it could be used for. What we did was we actually started from a core use case of local authority of a local authority planning officer who was trying to make retrofitting decisions, so understanding where they could fit in low carbon technologies in a particular neighbourhood in order to achieve their net zero commitments. Um, and what we did in that was we identified the whole data value chain, so what data would be um, was held where, who would need um, who would need to license it in what way. If you fast forward to where we are today. Um, we've taken a use case driven approach and that's led us to some of the largest energy companies in the UK sharing data with the right licenses um, and with assurance. It means that you can trust this data and you know what you can do with it. I'll talk more about assurance in a second, but I think it's really important to talk about um, both open and shared data here. So um, one of the things that we, oh, sorry, I've just been told that I'm speaking too quickly. I'm so sorry going to take a breath and slow down this is a common thing when I get really excited um sorry so taking slowing it down um one of the key things with open energy that we encountered was that um the gnarlier use cases so the ones that are more complicated and that help us to actually drive to net zero um the data that's needed to solve these isn't just open data um, we also needed to focus on what we refer to as shared data, um, so or what is referred to as shared data, which is data that's preemptively licensed or based on group-based access within a trusted ecosystem. And so this is how it, um, this is how we got to developing trust frameworks. So trust frameworks enable access to shared data. Once we've gone through that convening process, the icebreaking process, um, in which we've brought everyone together to agree the problem that we're trying to solve and how we're trying to solve it, um, we need to be able to codify and operationalize these rules. And that's what a trust framework is. So it codifies and operationalizes the rules within an, uh, with, that are, have been agreed within a market in order to enable the low friction flow of data. Um, trust frameworks allow many-to-many -many data sharing without the need for lots of one-to-one -one agreements and integrations. And this is incredibly essential as we build towards a future where the situation, particularly to do with data sharing, is only going to get more complicated. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So I've spoken a little bit about open energy, but I've also touched on a couple of other projects. So um, three years down the line since we started, um, actually probably more like three and a half since we started open energy um, and quite a few other projects later. And um, one of the major pieces of feedback that we have had from the market has been around trust. So how do you know that the data that you're using to make decisions can be trusted? And also, how do you as a data provider let people know how they can trust the data you're publishing or where the challenges might be in it? Um, and so as a direct result of that, we've designed an assurance aspect to, um, to what we do and to the trust frameworks that we implement. And we've actually tested it in the market in collaboration with SSEN. And now SSEN, for, I, I appreciate that I'm talking to an international audience. So SSEN, um, S, so Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks, are one of the key distribution network operators in the UK. Um, so this means that they're one of our um, six regulated monopoly companies that provide some of the electricity networks in the UK. And um, they um, have collaborated with us in testing um, this, uh, the assurance, that, uh, kind of the assurance process that we have designed. And there's two aspects to it. The first one is organizational and the second one is data set assurance. So the first aspect verifies who you are as an organization. And the second verifies that your data is published in accordance with the best practice principles in order to make it accessible and searchable on the web. An example of this in the kind of primary one is 
do you, have you assigned appropriate metadata? Is it um, do we have clear um, do we have a clear view to the license? Has that been described appropriately? And so, if you go to OpenNetZero.org now, you will be able to see this in action. Um, as in, if you search for some of SSE's data sets, you will see there how how this data um, how the assurance works. If we go to the final slide. Um, so after that whirlwind tour, apologies for being too quick at the beginning, I'm hoping that the pace is now um, a little bit easier to follow and translate, um, uh, or sorry, interpret, and um, I'm going to leave you this evening with my favourite saying that we use almost every day in Icebreaker 1, which is connect, don't collect. Um, I encourage you to think about building in interoperability from the start. Every single sector that you work with will tell you that there's, their sector is special. And to some extent it will be, but there are also completely common patterns across each one. Um, we at Icebreaker One first developed a trust framework under Open Energy, and we're seeing that in action now. But as I mentioned already, net zero is also a complex problem, and you don't just require energy data as a standalone thing. We're running projects in finance and in water, all of which link to and need the energy data as well. So one of them is Project Perseus, which is looking at automating scope one and scope two emissions reporting for all SMEs in the UK. This requires primary financial data, but also primary energy data. Um, Stream, uh, which we're working on with 11 of the 17 water companies, is developing a framework for, um, for the water companies in the UK to share data. And the use cases that have been selected in this also need energy data. I do think this interoperability point is super important, given that we're having this conversation this evening on, at the eve of COP28 and the annual climate negotiations. Um, we know that talking about net zero isn't just interoperability across the sectors that we need, it's also across the borders. And um, transboundary data sharing is going to be absolutely essential for us to be able to get to net zero. And given just how quickly we need to get there, I would say we need to be learning, sharing and collaborating from each other as much as possible which is again, why I'm delighted to be here this evening. I'll pause there in case there's any questions or anything, any points that anyone would like me to reiterate. Yes, hello. Thank you, Gia, for your presentation. Uh, just uh, for you know, you have a uh, space and time to make some questions and comments at the end of the final. So uh, thank you to share the ideas related and look at open data in the properly framework and uh, through the ecosystem with us. Move on for an hour, our next finalist. I ask you for how Xian uh, and join us just to offer you a bio re related uh, how she's working, sorry, uh, uh, working in NIU uh, statistics division. Also the coordinator of the intersecretary to working group on how to serve us and current position uh, right now but I also have a, a journey in uh, working various statistical area, include gender statistics, populations, civil resistance with DAO statistics. So uh, your floor, Howie, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you, you saw your slide. Yes, so um, thank you for inviting us to present our work on uh, citizen generated data that we started about a year ago, um, has been very exciting and very keen to see. I We know it's linked, sorry, I don't know why it's moving on in Zoom. It's super linked to um, open data, but um, you'll be able to tell a lot more on this. Um, so just today, I will uh, focus uh, my presentation on the very exciting Copenhagen framework, framework on citizen data, a little bit about history and why are we working on this and then what where we we are going next um so very briefly um we're past halfway of scg uh, implementation and we are looking very badly in terms of implementation but even worse in terms of data and this is one of the um chart we have shown about data availability at the global sdg database sdg indicator database that uh, by go but if we really look at data disaggregation, um, looking really dig down in, in, in terms of whether data are available by different dimensions. And it's even, it's very, very con of concern and uh, concerning. 
Um, so we've started journeys really to not just to think about the data availability or this more available disaggregated data, but also in, in terms of making data more inclusive. This is really uh, linked to our pledge for leaving the one behind. So we want data um, to really represent um, and every single citizen in, in the society. So we're talking about data robustness, uh, the quality of data, but we also talk about how relevant are the data uh, being collected. Do really citizens see themselves in the data in the data that are being collected, in the instrument that have been used to collect data, whether the data have been used really to voice their concerns and then um, um, otherwise, why would they give us data? Why would they respond to our surveys? So this, um, uh, imp these important points that like, really came from UK Office for National St National Statistics. So, mm, like to acknowledge their inclusive data task force recommendations report. That's really rich, and we've been going back uh, often to see what's new. Every time I go back and I see something new, um, really. So it's about uh, how do we make our data more inclusive. Um, if we look at inclusive data, we see a lot where citizens can contribute to and where citizens should be part of, for example, in building trust. Um, how do we really build trust with our citizens uh, in our data collection? So they are engaged in across different uh, stages of the data value chain. Um, and SDG implementation has been taking a whole system approach. Can we, should we should do that for the data as well? Um, and then we want to make sure that data are appropriate, the concepts are, are meaningful for them, and they see themselves in, in the questions that we are asking. Um, so they recognize it, and then the data also make um, is, meaningful, uh, is meaningful to them. And so our work related to citizen data is really also about uh, taking new approaches, because we have not been doing very well with our data. So the importance of the citizen generated that has been really taken up by um, very high level at UN, uh, including our Secretary General and Deputy Secretary General at the World Data Forum. What he said is CGD, citizen generated data allows people and communities to gather and take control of the data that affect their daily lives. So we're really talking about empower citizens. They are in control in data in the data in the data being collected in data collection itself of course this will help us improve data availability timeliness quality openness and inclusiveness and then also provide valuable insights especially for marginalized population groups we see a lot the official data just are not sufficient and to really get into the population groups that we really want to measure uh, to have information on to really support them they're often being left behind so november last year um we had expert group meeting in bangkok um that was the first time at, within the un Statistics Division, we brought civil society organizations on the table and together with National Statistical, Office, Statistical Offices um, to discuss how do we really leverage the power of citizens and the data they generate. There are a lot of data. Um, how can we work together? And um, the conclusion, there are two recommendations from that meeting. One is we need to know what we're talking about. What is citizen-generated data? Is uh, community level data driven by citizens and communities living in communities counted as CGD. How about social media data that we web scraped from Facebook? Those are also citizen data that provided by citizens. So it's, there were a lot of discussion around that. And then of course there was discussion on trust, lack of trust and how do we build trust and uh, data quality. How do we work with CGD that often comes in a format that official statisticians are not very familiar with, including qualitative data. And so um, the second recommendation is let's establish a collaborative uh, as a platform for us to work together. So these two recommendations were taken to the commission in 2023 and uh, March this year, and they were uh, received support from NSOs and on these two points. And in April 2023 at War Data Firm, we launched the collaborative officially. 
Um, I am not going to go through this. So these are some, I'd be happy to share the example. These are some of the examples. Um, so after April, uh, we have been working a lot to put the collaborative together, calling for members and or discussing what, how do we engage member with members? What levels, because we were, we're so experienced work, working with NSOs, but we're not experienced with working with CSOs because they are many layers and many of them. We don't know who to reach out to, uh, how to get them to to work uh, together. So um, there were a lot of discussion. There were a lot also discussion on the conceptual framework. So to support our work on the conceptual framework, we what we did is we um, prepared a background paper for an expert group meeting that we organized again, a uh, second one in Copenhagen, uh, September this year, focusing on the conceptual framework, right? And then we brought a lot of examples so people discuss if this CGD or not. Um, so these are the examples. Some are probably not, but we don't know. So we're still working on that. And I think the framework needs to be tested by real cases, case studies. Now, so the EGM in Copenhagen that we talked more about conceptual framework on citizen data had a lot, we, there was a draft framework presented and then uh, discussed ways and steps to operationalize the framework. And, and then how do we um, work together? How does the collaborative support operationalizing the conceptual framework? These are the three key objectives of the expert group meeting that we had in September, 2023. Um, these are some of the agenda items. So we talked a lot about importance of citizen data. Um, but a huge focus was on what is CGD. Um, so I will get into some of the discussions and some of the conclusions from the meeting. And we had um, a couple of sessions on the key principles. So you see their, their open data is really linked uh, with the principles over there as well. Um, and then we talk a lot about roadmaps. What do we do next? How do we test the framework? How do we know it's the right framework? We had about 80 people up over there, but that doesn't, it's a very small sample out of the, a large uh, community and data ecosystem. And so how do we know it's it, it works? Um, and then how do we implement it once we finalize it? And then we discussed a lot how to um, and really take advantage of the collab, how to make sure the collaborative works, how do we bring partners together? Now the framework, yeah, so the expert group meeting in Copenhagen, we had about 80 people and it was really big. I think that's the largest expert group meeting I've ever had in my work lifetime within the UN. A um, lot of group discussion, really focusing on some of the examples and um, key topics that we couldn't agree. So one of the sentiments from the meeting was people tend not to agree with each other, but they were so willing and happy to work together to reach some kind of agreement. So here is a revised definition. We call it a operation, what is it called? Operation, operational definition for statistical purposes, definition of citizen data. They are defined as data resulting from initiative that citizens are sufficiently engaged. So there's one element and in the design and data collection stages of the data value chain. So irrespective of whether or not these data are integrated into official statistics. So there are certain CGD that wanted to be part of official data statistics, but there are others that do not want to be there. They want to be independent. That's totally fine. But then that doesn't mean that NSOs or data st official statisticians cannot support them and support their work. So out of this definition that we see, there are three characteristics there. One is the level of citizen participation. So that defines sufficiently engaged. Um, the second one is stages of data value chain. Um, now we're talking about design, the design and data collection stages and the type of initiative. So this refers to who initiates it. And we often, uh, we had a lot of questions in, in the meeting and then outside the meeting too is, can NSO, national school offices, also start with CGD, also collect citizen data? How is it defined? So 
this you will see a lot of discussion in the conceptual framework. So this is a taxonomy we had. Um, the green columns, those are the ones that citizens and communities and CSO are driving a lot. In the driving seat, basically, they are either fully um, in, in the driving seat or in collaboration, or they do it together, initiate it together. But then there's also NSO driven. And in that category, the yellow categories or NSO other stake um, uh, agency driven data collection and then the citizen engagement, level of citizen engagement becomes extremely important. Um, certain levels are considered tokenized. So for example, for information informed, we informed our communities that we we're doing this or we consulted with town hall meeting. So this was very clear at the Copenhagen meeting that this is not sufficient engagement. And the last column, of course, the red one is initiative that without any collaboration with citizens, they are not considered as citizen data, the data that produced from that. We have um, a set of principles that we put together. And so this is really, uh, put together building on existing principles, including the fundamental principles of official statistics, the principles of citizen science, the care principles for indigenous data governance, and then taking a right-based approach to data. So sorry for the comma there. As you can see, the last item is about openness and accessibility of citizen data. That is super important. Uh, next steps, a roadmap. So um, we are um, going to really mobilize resources and partners to work together on this topic, to really empower citizens and bring more data and, and also really empower citizens. And we're going to finalize the, the Copenhagen framework on citizen data uh, with case studies proof concepts and testing the applicability uh, of the framework. And we're going to hold global and regional consultations uh, about on, on the framework. We also support the implementation of the framework. Um, you can see the logos down there. These are the steering committees of the collaborative. So we are going to support implementation at, at the global level, at the national level. And we also really uh, wanted to work with our partners to really get connected with the communities. For example, there are a lot of great practices at the community level. We'd like to get them to the global level so we can amplify their impact. And at the same time, a lot of work we have been doing at the global level, we like the message cross to the local level, right? All the way to the communities. Um, along the way, as we worked since last year, um, a lot of discussion and questions on data quality, building trust. Um, how do we work qualitative data? How do we put qualitative data and quantitative data together? And how do we approach CSOs as national stick offices um, if we, we would like to work with citizen data? So that's another question. And then, so a lot of questions and there are a lot of um, needs uh, for capacity building at the national level and the local level for CSOs, but also for national offices. So this would be really um, the work under the collaborative uh, that will really support the implementation of the Copenhagen framework. Uh, next step. Um, so March 2024, we are really uh, working on a revised draft of con conceptual framework after Copenhagen meeting. Uh, so in March next year, it will be submitted to Stack Commission for um, their comments and, and we'll be organizing uh, what we call it consultation meetings online as well. Invite um, everyone to join us and give us feedbacks on that. Um, in June 2024, we have an EGM and ex another expert group meeting and then from March next year to March 2025, it's really about testing uh, the conceptual framework and, and we are working on a set of guidance on how to test the conceptual, what that kind of question we want to ask. Um, and then identify areas that needs um, methodological development and then collaborative will work together on guidance. Now, 2025, 
um, or submit the final conceptual framework for uh, approval, adoption, we don't know yet, by the commission. But this is something that's for the commission, for NSO, but also goes beyond NSO. We're talking about civil society organizations as well and, and other partners. So um, they will be fully consulted before it's finalized. So we want to see that's being used by everyone. Um, that's all from my side. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, and this is the email we have, sitting.data at un.org. And there's also a link to the collaborative website um, if you scan the bar. What is it called? The code there. Yes. Thank you, Hai. Thank you for sharing uh, the development of a framework on citizen data. Yeah, you have opportunity to have some questions in the end. We also have some in the chat. Feel free, please, to address your comments or questions in the chat. Move on for our last finalist. We're happy to have Pete Matters, Master Hears. Uh, he is a special project lead at uh, human, human, sorry, <laughs> Humanitarian Open Street uh, Team MAPE. So he usually works to include community, uh, maybe informal settlements for climate change, uh, change realization, and adapt adaptation. Please feel free, uh, Pete, it's your floor. Thank you, Larissa. I'm just going to share my screen. So humanitarian open street map team is a mouthful, so we shorten it to hot so that we don't have to say it all the time. Um, but I, I thought it was a good effort. Um, so we are a we are an NGO. Um, we work with open mapping. I think we say open mapping rather than open data because we prefer the verb to the noun. It's a process as well as a a data output. And we have two kind of two kind of parallel parallel uh, focuses. One is humanitarian action, and one is uh, community development. So I'm gonna. Um, I'll share the link to the slides afterwards. There's actually quite a lot more slides in the deck than I'm showing. I've skipped lots, but there's more information if you want it. So essentially, we envision a world where community needs are addressed through mapping, where everyone can access and contribute, and where open map data is available and used for impact. And I think I'd like to concentrate on the last one for this, this 10 minutes that I have. So essentially, trying to make sure the right data is in the right place at the right time and with the right people, that it's open by default and used for decisions, and that it's a collective effort, that it's a global digital public good. Um, so that's kind of like how we how we see the path to, to impact. On the humanitarian side, we do a lot of mapping post, uh, post, post disaster, well, not just disaster, epidemics, other types of humanitarian crises trying to get the trying to get map data that's useful into the hands of the people that need it as quickly as possible but we also do a lot of work um around development program and community development which is much more i guess much more with communities rather than for communities um so giving communities activists local partners the tools and the data they need to to meet specific challenges that they're experiencing or to take advantage of opportunities and to try and get good quality open data into the hands of decision makers. When we talk about um, open data, oh, sorry. When we talk about open data, the vast majority of the data that we create or that we support the creation of goes into OpenStreetMap. And I'm assuming most people here will know what OpenStreetMap is. But just in case you don't, it's a free, open, editable map of the world. I think it was uh, someone had a go at valuing it last year, and it's valued at about one point six seven billion dollars. Um, there are multiple huge tech companies building infrastructure around it: um, TomTom, Tom, Meta, Amazon, Microsoft. So I feel like if I had given this presentation ten years ago, I would have said one of the limitations is that people don't yet believe or trust in the data. The other two panelists talked a lot about trust. But I think that ship has sailed. Like big, big players are investing heavily in this because the data is, is great quality. Um, HOT works in four priority regions um, through these open mapping hubs. 
Um, we have teams in each of these hubs who who focus on both disaster response and um, and community development. So they do a huge variety of different things, which I have distilled down to the, <laughs> these three points, um, but essentially connecting different partners around open data and decision making and open mapping, working with people to actually create the data they need and to try and like be a part of a be a part of a movement towards open data. So OpenStreetMap started back in 2004 as a, a reaction to the corporate ownership of, of our local data. That's why it, why it existed. And we sort of continue continue the, 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 the mission that OpenStreetMap started to be a part of this movement towards uh, a, a global public good. So we do a lot of different things. And the brief for this presentation was to kind of show some good examples and talk about the benefits, but to also talk about the limitations and challenges around um, open data and open mapping in this context. And I think whilst this is kind of a what we do slide, it actually speaks quite well to the challenges. So you can see data quality. We know that quality of data has to be high, it has to be relevant. You can see partnerships. So I think there was a question in the chat about training for NGOs. So we train NGOs, but we also accompany them. We 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 collaborate, we co-design projects with them so that the so that we're really kind of learning together and making like the best use of the, the data and the tools. We develop open source mapping tools. So we try and put those, you know, the thing the things that would normally cost you a lot of money, <laughs> we try and put them into people's hands for free. Um we try and fund community organizations to build the movement. We we do do training and skill shares. We support local open street map communities to exist. We believe that strong local entities are an important part of our mission. And of course, we create maps and data to support people affected by disasters, humanitarian crises, and other types of problems. I have a few examples and then I'll finish. Um, so this is to try and give a flavor of some different types of work that we do. This is from the Turkey Syria earthquake. Um, that happened early this year. Um, as I'm sure you know, there was a there was a huge earthquake that affected communities in both countries. Um, Hot and a local uh, Turkish mapping NGO activated. We call it. We 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 started a response together, and we had about nine and a half thousand to ten thousand volunteers join us in the res this response, providing data across the affected areas. But I want to talk about these three examples that you can see. And when I give you the slides, there's links embedded in all of these. So you can go to the source material. So the one in the middle, this was a photo taken, I think, about a week after the earthquake happened. And this is the Turkish Search and Rescue Association with OpenStreetMap printed out and on the wall of their coordination office. The top one is a analysis by Crisis Ready, where they integrated OpenStreetMap data and mixed it with other data types to provide analysis of, about like the needs of affected, affected people. And the bottom one was beautiful because this guy is a public health official who contacted uh, the Turkish OpenStreetMap community and said, can you help me map the tent cities that we're building? Because I can't do public health without good geospatial data. And this, the story he tells, which is well worth watching, um, is about how Hot and the Turkish OSM community collaborated to build maps of these of these tent cities, and he used them for public health programming. And when the local authorities saw him using them, they then took them and they used the same data to install electricity and run logistics. And this same data set ended up being used for a number of different things. Larissa, I haven't kept an eye on the time so please wave at me if i'm overrunning yes no you can continue it's around more of four minutes okay great thanks thank you so away from the kind of emergency response um this was a project in niger um and this was in collaboration with um two local district uh technical officers in ngonga and fakara and the open street map niger uh community so they found that they did not have the data they needed to understand the situation with water and sanitation, particularly with water, um, to be able to plan and to be able to advocate for improved water access. So 
the uh, open mapping hub in West North Africa teamed up with Ursa and Niger and with these technical officers to do kind of um, to do remote mapping from satellite imagery to understand the population spread throughout the area, and then to do mapping of, of water infrastructure locally. So essentially, these technical officers who previously had a blank map where they wanted to have stuff now have the map they need to 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 do their planning and to do their advocacy. Um, sorry, my slides have been slow. This one was a, is a collaboration with the Zambia Statistics Agency. So I'm trying to provide uh, a spectrum of examples from emergency response to census planning. Um, so with the Zambian Statistics Agencies, there were enumeration areas they called zero populated areas. And they didn't know who lived there. They didn't know how many people lived there. Uh, they didn't know how to plan for a good quality census. So we teamed we teamed up with uh, with Zamstats and the OpenStreetMap community in Zambia, and together the the community of volunteers um, mapped 125,000 buildings and 170 kilometers of road across 10 districts. And this information was then used in the in the enumeration activities. So they actually created maps so that enumerators could make sure that they did a kind of that there was rigor in the way that they planned and, and implemented their um, their census data collection. Uh, I'm going to skip to this one. So this is slightly different. This is uh, this is in collaboration with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, the NGO. So this is um, really about kind of humanitarian medical. Um, and it's kind of a classic, um, it's kind of a classic uh, example for, for heart, the cholera outbreak uh, use case. So when, when an MSF is responding to an outbreak of any kind, really, the population, um, the population statistics um, are important. You may hear in your, in your clinic that there's 10 cases here and 100 cases there and 300 cases there. But if you don't know the total population of those villages, those numbers are a little bit meaningless. Um, also, if you don't know how they're geolocated, you don't know where the similarities lie, like whether they're all along a particular trade route, like how the disease is spreading. So this again was a, this, a collaboration between MSF and OpenStreetMap community and HOT. And MSF used the OpenStreetMap data to pinpoint cholera origins, to plot the cases to the map and assess water access. And it led to it led to it led to an operational decision of where to put a treatment center, which meant that um, you know people flowed through a hundred twenty bed treatment center that was hopefully appropriately located for their needs. So I think I'll stop there and um, hand it back over. If anyone has questions, I'm super happy to to join the debate. Thank you, Preet, to share us uh, a lot of uh, value the case, how we can increase humanitarian actions with data and your support from uh, hot team teammate. So uh, to gain uh, our audience to make some questions, uh, you start. I'd like to receive from you some recommendations or uh, just share with us some lessons uh, that you have from your experience and from your uh, your. Uh, sorry, from your uh, non-governmental non organization, how you can improve data as a public god? Which kind of efforts we should do it? Do you, do you understand? Someone want to start? Make some comments? I, I, missed, I missed one word. You said how you can improve. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I just uh, ask you, uh, stand off your experience, uh, Piri, uh, Gia, and uh, Hanoi. How you can increase data as a public got? How you can increase it? How you can make some efforts? Are we waiting for each other to go first? <laughs> I think maybe maybe I maybe I maybe I'll go I'll go quickly. So I think um, 
One thing we're finding, so Heart is in a process of localization and has been for a few years. Like we did only do the humanitarian thing when we started. And this localization process has meant much more deep collaboration with local communities, with local NGOs on kind of issues which are in, more entrenched longer term. Um, and I think like one thing that we learn is that the quality, there's two parts to the qu data quality question. And the first one is about like, is it correct? And the second one, is it correct for what it, it's to be used for? And I think like where we see real success and where we see communities continue to produce their own data after a particular project is where that collaboration at the start has been really strong. And there's the old adage of like, you know, an hour spent on planning is 10 hours less spent on spent on implementation. And I know that's not always true. You can over plan. But I really think like that deep collaboration and deep understanding of the of the problem and and working out how to try and solve that problem together is key. And that's where we see the kind of exponential growth of the data rather than just what we implement or support. Thank you, Pete. Someone have some comments about Dick? Yeah, you want to start first and that? Yes, that. please. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, sure. I'm happy to jump in. I mean, um, I feel less qualified to comment on this than the other um, panelists because I work more with businesses um, directly on understanding what data that they, they hold and how they might license it. Um, but we do also work a lot with um, kind of uh, civil society organisations and understanding civil society impact on some of the things that are being proposed. Um, and I think that so I basically I only really have two two things to add um, and also um, Pete was incredibly extensive and incredibly clear on what he said. But the first one is um, one of the key things that we always try and do is be use case driven. Um, so uh, one of the things that we try and avoid is just going, oh, just all of the data. It'll just everything will solve it. Um, it's what is it that you need? How does it help solve the problem that you're trying to solve? OK, well, then let's start there. Um, and then the second one is around feedback loops. Um, so being able to provide feedback about the data quality, about the data, um, the kind of, oh, well, um, and even from our experience, it's even from kind of a data publisher side, um, an, an energy company being able to say something like, hey, I know that this data set's incomplete. Um, I know that there's some bits missing, but if you can just tell me where they are, then we'll then we can work on investing and fixing it. And the same uh, the same applies for the users of that data. Then being able to have an open line of communication, saying I'm using it for X Y Z, and what I'm noticing is this is missing from it. So could we improve that particular aspect, not just all of it in total? Um, hey, I pass to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm wearing different hats, right? For the for the CGD work, the citizen data that we're working, I think it's there's so much data, there's so much energy, and I wouldn't even say there's no expertise at the, the civil society organizations or local communities. There are um, they not only data expertise, and they know what are the issue, what the issues are important to them. They know what kind of data that they really need, so they, they probably don't know to some point how sample should be drawn in that sense, but. They know what matters to them. And and so I think there is so much energy, so much expertise that we need to work together to make them from the official side and then from the civil society organization, from the community to work together to make data there and to make an impact. Oftentimes we see a lot of impact at local level, right? They don't even have to go to the national level to, to really make an impact. And the other thing I think it's really... Um, the uh the open data aspect as I'm wearing the household survey hat. There's so many surveys being done, and you see five tables out of a million, a ten million dollar household surveys. It's really not okay. I think the investment that we put into data collection, um, it, it's not. We're not getting the value back. So there are data. They're not being disseminated or not interoperable enough that to be used, or there's no metadata to understand what's behind the data collection. So all this, um, and because there's so much potential to, to use these data and also to link the data from different sources. Without all these metadata or information about the data or, and then the data itself, they just, 
they sit there and we invest in data collection, nothing is being used. Um, the other thing I think is from the combination of two uh, household survey, official data collection versus citizen data, is I see a lot. So we, from the household survey community, we face a lot of challenge in terms of declining response rate. And citizens just don't want to respond to our surveys. There got to be a reason why. Why are they doing everything on Facebook but not, or Instagram or whatever, but not um, talking to us? So how can we bring our movements on citizen data engagement, sufficient engagement into also try to change the culture of how official statisticians do our own work and how we connect uh, with our communities and our respondents, our communities, our users of data. And then the feedback loop, of course, is important. So yeah, I think a lot of investment has been there. I think it's really good for us to really push to some front and to, to make our value back and there will be more data. Thank you. Thank you, Hai, for incredible uh, answer. Take advantage uh, for your answer, just to say a question that you have on the chat. Uh, so Carl asked us what sort of education or training uh, we, uh, we need for, uh, how I can say, uh, improve no uh, data by no governmental organization, if you have some recommendation about that. So to finalize, I also would like to pass the floor to you, Freda, my colleague, because she has some questions uh, and comments to share with you also. Thank you. Thanks so much, Larissa. Uh, thank you to the panelists as well for sharing um, your expertise. For those who don't know me, my name is Wilfrida Edward Dulcie. And as Larissa mentioned, I'm the government co-chair of this working group. Apologies for not having my camera on, but uh, given as I sat how I sound, I'm it's better this way. Please trust me. Um, so I just wanted to take a quick moment to mention that I'll be stepping down as government co-chair, and this will be my last ODC session. Um, because I've accepted a role in the government of Canada with whom I work. The last two years um, as co-chair have been such a positive experience for me and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to have, have had the opportunity to both contribute, to learn from and to grow with this amazing community. So thank you all for the dedication that you have to this group, for showing up every month with your questions, with your comments, to the panelists who brave this stage every single month. And thank you to the ODC team for the chance that you took on me for giving me this opportunity. So I look forward to staying connected and uh, to say a proper goodbye, hopefully in my in my farewell blog. Uh, but until then, thank you all again. Thank you, Fred. Uh, you are happy to have you with us uh, for those years. So just to come back uh, to take our two last minutes, uh, if you have some recommendation related training uh, and make some quick question or, or comments, you'll be happy to receive from you, PD Giawai. Thank you. No, I just want to say thank you to Wilfreda for this amazing, this amazing year. So thank you very much, Wilfreda, and good luck for the for the new job on parents. I, I, I can say just one sentence about the, uh, the capacity building. So, I mean, for the CGD, we're really looking at um, sort of a stock taking exercise. We're also encouraging countries at national level. So we're supporting a couple of countries to do a, a mapping exercise and then really assess what's needed because I think capacity building for that was very clear from our, not I think from our expert group meeting is the capacity building needs to be done for both civil society organization and national stock offices. So um, we are really doing an assessment, see what's needed and then there will be um, uh, um, guidance provided based on experiences, right? And what worked, what didn't work in countries. And then they was, these will be used to support countries. So there are really, there are about data quality, like NSOs are very much interested in how to use uh, the qualitative data together with the quantitative surveys. Thank you.
and to inform policy. It's a very new thing. It's a very new topic for NSOs. It's not a new topic for social scientists, but it is for, for our official statistics. And then for CSOs, I think it's a lot about what are the data process and how do I document my data? Even if they are doing well, but it's not well documented. It's a, it's an issue for both, huh? for official data as well. So metadata is always not very good. Indeed, thank you, Howie. So I ask you not to close this meeting with us today. So thank you so much to, to be here. That's it, thank you. From my side, Nati, if you want to say some words. Just want to thank everybody here, all the speakers, uh, all the people that participated. Ah, thanks also, Wilfreda, for running the implementation working group calls for, for this, this year, letting everybody know that ODC is open to help with this non-governmental created data work. Uh, we'd love to, to be part of, of a hub and connecting different experiences as we did today. Um, official statistics, people working with private sector, people working for humanitarian processes. Um, and, and that's the part, the kind of work that we do. Um, once again, wanted to thank Wilfreda and we will be on the search for a new implementation working group co-chair from a governmental office. And uh, this is actually the last implementation working group call uh, of the year because uh, the last week of December, we don't think anybody will join. <laughs> and uh, We all deserve very much our rest. Um, so we will be convening again in January of next year to organize the agenda for the rest of the year. We will um, contact all the all the speakers uh, of this session to ask for their uh, presentations and send to everybody that, that participated. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. bye. See you bye. in the next year. Bye. Bye. Merry Christmas in advance.